any of the names of the exercises changed as Joe taught them? And if so, have the essence of the exercises changed? Well, that's two really different questions. Um, the names of exercises. Some of them Joe named, some of them some of his clients named. A lot of them never had names. Um, you know, it was an easy way of identifying. You know, if you have a name for an exercise, it's an easy way of identifying it. Um, but I would say at least half of them, maybe even more, did not have names. Mm -hmm. And yeah, names have changed. People ask me about an exercise, they have no idea what they're talking about. When they name it, then they say, you know, oh, oh that, okay. Um, <laughs> so, but that's something that's so superficial, and as far as I'm concerned, really has nothing to do with the work, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, one of my clients um, calls a spine corrector an elephant. <laughs> Because it's shaped like an elephant. It, she just decided it looked like an elephant, so to her, the spine corrector is the elephant. <laughs> that's so um, cute. You know, all right, doesn't change the work on it, does it? That's, that makes her happy. Hey, be happy. <laughs> you know? uh, so, you know, the names are names, and that's that. And what was the other part of that? About the, the essence of the exercises. The essence. Yeah, that's another whole story. Um, and sometimes the names, actually sometimes the names will affect that. I was thinking of single leg pull. Yeah, well there's one, yeah, exactly. Uh, everybody now calls it the single leg stretch, and the double leg stretch. And Joe called it the single leg pull, and the double leg pull. And part of the problem with that, what's happened is, is I see people, sometimes I want to slap them, it's like they're dusting their knees. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just so sweet and lovely. It was a pull with a one, two, and you pulled. You know, it was strong. Right. Um, so there, there, that's a very good example of how the name is affected. So in, in some cases, something like that, yeah, where, where the name is giving the wrong impression of what an exercise should be. I don't know too many of those, though. But, I, but again, I keep, every day it seems like I'm hearing new names, so I don't know. That's true. Well, I guess it comes down to some of the core exercises that, uh, I guess that question could have some different uh, interpretations in, in terms of if the name changes the exercise or not. In some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. Yeah, well, if it, if it does change the exercise, then that's something that I don't like. <laughs> But just if it's a way of remembering it or something, sure. Um, you know, call it whatever you want to, as long right. as it doesn't change the exercise. Okay, well, and let's check the rest of that question. Um, has the essence of the exercises changed? Okay, well, we really did answer that question yeah. in the end. Um, so there's some questions about on this same topic, like where do exercises like mermaid and neck roll come from, and did Ramana invent the end of the stomach series? Um, well, the neck roll, I think Ramana added in, I think. Um, I, I feel like someone told me that, too. Yeah, we never ever Or did even that. Ramana told us that. Yeah, we never did that in the original studio, I know. The mermaid was around, but I don't know why everybody's obsessed with the mermaid these days. Um, it was done occasionally in Joe's studio if somebody really needed it for a particular reason, but it was never part of the reformer as a, one of the regular mm -hmm. exercises of the reformer. Um, Would Joe have taught it on the reformer, really? Or? I don't remember him ever. In fact, I even questioned whether it was ever a reformer exercise in good old Karen. I got a photo from somewhere to show okay. Joe doing the mermaid on the reformer. Wow. Uh, you know, in a picture from the 1920s or something. So yeah, he did it on the reformer, but he never taught it on the reformer. It was done on the wonder chair. Generally, if it was done, it was done on the wonder chair. Um, or the Cadillac. Mm -hmm. but it, I, don't even, I don't even remember seeing it on the reformer until, I don't know, it was way, way, way down the line, long after Joe died. Mm -hmm. Before I ever saw it on the reformer. From your point of view, what might be a reason he would give that exercise to a particular person for a body need? 
probably something to do with opening up in the hips or whatever. Some of scoliosis, it's good for people with scoliosis mm -hmm. um, because you can really, if, if you're doing it on a form, the, the thing that's great about it is the, the instructor really has access to the person's body. Right. And I do it, I've got a knee in the back and I'm pulling them here and I'm pulling the ribs in here. And, yeah. you know, and again, for someone you know, with scoliosis in particular, it's good because you can get things to open up. and. Okay. Um, so imbalances like that are just to get this opening up and out. So, okay, so back to the questions about um, the mat work. And the one of the questions that someone asked was, did uh, Ramana create the end of the stomach series, what's known as the, the series of five or the stomach series? Yeah, all, all there was in Joe's mat is the single leg pull and the double leg pull. I think, I know the crisscross he did at one point, but he got so mad with it because everybody would do it so fast. He said it looked like football practice, mm -hmm. uh, and he stopped teaching it mm -hmm. altogether. Um, the other two, the scissors and the the double leg lift. Um, I don't know. I mean, we do the scissors on the small barrel and on the spine corrector. We oh, do them with true. leg springs. So, so they're there. They're there in the. The body of the repertoire. Yeah. Um, so whether Joe at one point did those on the mat, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but it was Romana who put those three exercises in there mm -hmm. because she was seeing too many people whose stomachs were weak and flabby. Okay. And Romana does not like weak, flabby stomachs, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so she put those in. Get them. Get them. And I have no objection to it because I agree with her. You know, you, you need to get that strength, and it's a good way to do it. It's a good way to do it, yeah. Um, let's see about, well, here's an interesting question. Um, what are some of the most common things that Jay sees now being taught differently from the way you were taught? And at one point, someone heard that you were said to have called Joe a carny, and whether you could elaborate on that. <laughs> I thought I thought I would clear like that up because it's a fun question. Again, it's two different. Yes. Two, two different. Two different questions. questions. Well, the carny thing, you know, Joe certainly was a genius. There's no question about that. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. I don't think anybody ever understood the body the way he did. But what happened now, and I laugh inside all the time, people talk about Joseph. <laughs> it's like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> you know, they put him there with Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama, and I don't know what. Joe, his background, he was a circus performer. We're not talking Cirque du Soleil. We're not talking the glamour of the circus. We're talking these small little circuses that used to tour Europe, lock up your daughters. <laughs> that kind of circus. They were carnies. <laughs> that was that's that was his milieu. Boxing. We're not talking Oscar de la Hoya glamour in Las Vegas, people paying a fortune to go to these glorious elaborate venues for a boxing match. It was a sleazy profession. Hmm. This was Joe's milieu. Uh, yes, he cleaned up well. You know, you could take him out in polite society, but what he, uh, what he grew up in and spent all of his young years in mm -hmm. before he came to America, was this kind of almost underworld kind of existence, and so it's like, and nobody called him Joseph. He would sign his name Joseph, but you know, he was Joe, or Uncle Joe, or Papa Joe. But uh, so when people so reverently say Joseph, I'm like, oh, get over it, you know, because he really was. Like I say, you know, he cleaned up well. You could, you know, he could go out in, in public, but at heart, he was still this this guy who had, you know, who had spent all of his formative years and so much of his life in this kind of underworld existence. I mean, Joe was not a stranger to fights, and I mean street brawls. Things like that. This was, this was Joe. You know, he wasn't exactly the guy you wanted to your daughter to bring home. <laughs> you know, Clara calmed him down to a certain extent, but um, even when he even when he left Germany to come to America, 
Now, I, I got this story from Chuck Rappaport, the photographer who did all those wonderful photographs for Sports Illustrated. Joe had told Chuck that he had invented, of course, some, it sounds almost like a combination of brass knuckles and a cat of nine tails somehow rolled into one. But he got into a bar fight and the Gestapo came in and he knocked out and bloodied a few of the Gestapo with oh. this thing and had to get out of town. <laughs> You know, they were after him. So this was Joe, you know. Is it true he had a glass eye in his yes, later years? And was that from a fight of some Supposedly kind? it was a boxing man with a glass eye. Wow. That's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, so so you know, none of this diminishes the genius of his work. Uh, and I'm I'm sure that the same things that drove him and all of that are what drove him to keep at this work for 80 years yeah. and to be so determined with it. He was like an evangelist when it came to his work. I mean, he was so convinced that, you know, that he had the answer, and he did. You know, it's taken a long time for people to realize that. But, um, yeah, so he, he, was a, he was a character. Are the photos, I've seen photos of him, and I believe it's his brother, dressed up like Greek, in Greek outfits. Posing was that sort of one of their circus things? They did. They did. Yeah, they did a. I think they did a Roman gladiator thing. Yeah, and that's did, what it was. Um, they did. Um, I don't know, maybe some Greek wrestling or something. Okay. I'm not sure. So that kind of show. Yeah. In a little tiny circus. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's go into. Uh, well, there was another part to that one. Yes, there was. Um, what are some of the most common things that you see now being taught differently from the way you were taught? Practically everything. Mm. For Joe, the first and foremost thing was move. As I said, you could be there three months before you got a correction, and then it was use your gut. And then maybe three weeks later, long your back. Uh, it wasn't all of this big, 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 and all this. And I never heard an anatomy term. It was move, move, move. Because, as I say, Joe's real genius is that he built everything into the work. Mm -hmm. And if you just do the work, it will happen. He wanted you to find it. Yeah. It was a matter of self-discovery. Now everybody wants to tell you everything, and they take so long in doing it. The most important thing is to move. And I tell teachers all the time in workshops, you know, Dangerous, we never allow. Bad, get used to, because you're going to see a lot of it. And you will. And you cannot change a body in an hour. I don't care how much anatomy you know or how much picking you do. All you're going to do is demean the person, make them feel like an idiot, like they're never going to be able to do anything. They have to sweat. They have to move. It's exercise. It's not physical therapy. It's very correct exercise. And it can alleviate a lot of the problems in the body. I mean. Joe believed, rightly so, that so many of the basic aches and pains that people have come from poor alignment. So everything is about alignment. But because you see it doesn't mean you can tell the person and they're going to change it right now. It's up to you as a teacher to give them the right exercises that will open them up, that will strengthen the muscles that need to be strengthened. This is what a good teacher does, not talk all the time. but guide the person mm -hmm. so they can find in their body what's happening. And that's what Joe and Clara did. And I don't see that now. Now everybody wants to talk, 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 pick, pick, pick. Mm -hmm. And nobody moves. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I had a woman come to me once. She had been doing Pilates three times a week somewhere for several years. And she came to me in her first lesson. And we're halfway through the footwork. And she just stopped dead. And she went, I'm sweating. I said, so? Keep moving. And she went a little bit more and she stopped again and she said, for three years I never sweat once. She said, was I wasting my money? I said, you're wasting your breath. Keep moving. You know. Um, but you know, I hear stories like that and I'm thinking, what the hell were they doing for three years? What was she doing? Well, you, you commented on this it recently that when I was with you, that Joe, you see him in his videos and teaching people, and he's going like this a lot. Mm -hmm. Because he's 
Yes. Basically, say keep going. Go. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like you can see the impatience. And, you know, just you know, move, move. And that's that's what it should be. Um, so I, I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, and another thing, and this ties into so much in several of these questions that are here, the way people are trained, everything is, you know, the certification programs are really kind of necessary evils because you have to start somewhere, you have to have some kind of a foundation. But when somebody has, I don't care which one it is, all the certification programs, they have to have some kind of a plan, some kind of a syllabus. They have to have a means of testing people. So it's right or it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Already that's not Pilates. Mm -hmm. Pilates is not black and white. It's all kinds of shades of gray. And there was no such thing as beginner, intermediate, advanced. There were simply exercises. And you gave the body the exercises that were appropriate for it. And what happens now with, with the certification programs, people are taught this is the beginner work. This is the intermediate. This is the advanced. And you don't dare step over that line into intermediate until you've done all the beginning. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. you, you, you give the body what it needs. And nobody is going to come to you perfectly balanced and aligned. That's what we're all about, is to, to get that balance and alignment. They're going to be stronger in some ways, weaker in others. That doesn't mean you ignore the strong. You have to work the strong as well as the weak. People have to walk out feeling good about themselves. So you should always finish a lesson with something they do well so that they can walk out saying, hey, did you see what I did? Mm -hmm. you know, they have to walk out feeling good about themselves. It may not be an exercise they need, but it's something they do well. So do it, show off. That, that leads, so it so fits in with your, um, what you describe as it being a path of self-discovery as well. Um, because I feel like that's what gives you the confidence to take what you're learning through your movement and your confidence in your body because you're discovering it yourself and someone's just sort of pushing you along and then you get to be responsible for that in the rest of your life. It's not that someone gave it to you or mm -hmm. taught it to you or there's no one who owns it, it's you. Exactly, exactly. And it's why I don't even like the term Pilates teacher. Yeah. I wish we could be called something else, a Pilates guide or, yeah. uh, you know, because really that's what we should be doing. We should be kind of guiding people and, and helping them to, to find what they have inside of them. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. That is, it feels like a lot of the magic of this method is, is this path of self-discovery. Oh, it is. It yeah. absolutely is. I think that's one of the things that was so wonderful. In, in Joe's studio, um, the energy mm. in the place. And it sounds like the way it was run it made you so responsible for oh, go do your thing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You're not waiting for me, go do it. Absolutely, and the minute you walked in that studio, it was kind of electrifying. I mean, you knew you were there to work. <sighs> it was just in the air. You knew you were gonna work. And it wasn't, it wasn't rigid, you know, the certification programs don't make everything so rigid in terms of how you do and what you do. I remember one day, I love this, it was so funny, when we were on 56th Street, this is after Joe had died, and again, nobody had appointments. And for some reason, this one afternoon, it was like everybody in New York decided to go to Pilates at the same time. <laughs> the place was jammed. Every single apparatus had a body on it, and, everybody, and Romana, <laughs> Stop talking, stop talking, move. You should be moving, not talking. Why are you still, how long have you been on that reformer? It's too long, it's too long. Finish up, people are waiting for that. Did you get your mat done yet? Why aren't you on the electric chair? You know you need that. And she was just like, go, 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 go. And the elevator opened right into the studio, and all of a sudden the elevator door opened. And here was a guy who had been a client forever. He was one of Joe's old clients. And the door opened, and he went like this, and Momana saw him, she says, come on in, come on in, there's room. <laughs> so he goes into the dressing room, gets changed, he comes back out, and he's looking around, and Momana says, you can start, you can start, you can start, oh, there's some wall space over there, go start over against the wall. Right. But that was, that's, that's, you know, that was kind of an unusual afternoon, but there were times when it could get extremely crowded like that, and you, 
you didn't, you know, normally a normal lesson would start on the reform and then go to the mat and then go to the, to the other apparatus. But it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be. There was no law that said that. You could start on the mat. You could start on the Cadillac. You could start on the wall. You could start with the foot corrector, which, by the way, is a good thing to do with some of these guys who come in at 6 o'clock after a day and they're like this. Give them a nice foot massage to start with. Hmm. Then they won't destroy your reformer when you put them on there. <laughs> and they'll get something out of it. It's, a lot of it is just, you know, there's, there's a tremendous creative aspect to teaching Pilates. Um, Joe did the science. He did the science. So you just, again, it's all in knowing what exercises to give a person when. And that's really what makes a good teacher. But it's all, again, the self-discovery. That's really mm -hmm. one of the most important things. Um, can we go back to talking about Clara? Because someone asked about what was Joe and Clara's relationship like? Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, what was she like? Oh, Clara was wonderful. Um, they had a very old-fashioned, old-world relationship. Clara would never step into his spotlight. He was the master of the house, at least when anybody was around. I would love to have been a fly on the wall in their apartment. Because there were times you'd see Clara just give him a look. And it was like, wait till I get you home. But she would never do or say anything in front of anybody. Um, it was always Joe. And said, you know, she probably walked two steps behind him on the street, I don't know. But she was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant, brilliant teacher. She was so extraordinary. And Joe, Joe, again, because of his genius, he wanted to challenge you and he wanted you to challenge him. And if you could meet on that level, fine. The minute you went, oh, he was through with you. Clara! And he, would, he wouldn't even say, speak to you, he wouldn't even say hello. He would just, he didn't want to deal with anybody. There had to be that almost butting of heads where no matter what he threw at you, you, you did it. Not necessarily brilliantly, but at least you attempted it, you didn't complain, you didn't question. Then. You got along. I think the reason I got along with them was because I was so terrified of him. I mean, whatever he said, I just did it. You know, there was no way. Would, you know, and you just didn't question him. Um, Clara, on the other hand, I think Clara really invented tough love because she she was extraordinarily kind, but tough at the same time, mm -hmm. and it was very much you know, this is for your own good kind of thing, <laughs> you know. Um, and she didn't talk a lot. She, in fact, I never had a real conversation with Clara until after Joe died. So I'd been there for, for several years. Right. Uh, and it wasn't until after Joe died that we suddenly started actually having conversations and became quite close. And she's a lovely, lovely, lovely woman and just such a brilliant teacher because she had she had this simpatico thing where, as I say, she could be very tough. Mm -hmm. But she also had a great sense of humor when she showed it. Mm -hmm. um, she had to be in the right mood and had to be the right person to bring it out in there. Um, because basically, I mean, again, she was, she was very even keeled. And she was just very professional. And she did her work. And ultimately was a far better teacher than Joe because she had the patience and wasn't as volatile. Um, but like I say, I would love to have been a fly in the wall in that apartment. <laughs> be really great. Because like I say, every now and then you just see her give him a look, like. <laughs> there was a story. I did. It, did you talk about this? About, um, or maybe it was Chuck Rappaport when Chuck Rappaport, the photographer who again took the the photos that were in Sports Illustrated. Um, some of the photos, Joe doesn't have a shirt on. He just has his trunks on. He was in his 80s at that point, and then in other photos, he has a white turtleneck on. Yeah, I've talked with Chuck about that. The ones without the shirt were done in the morning. Whenever, and it's interesting because Chuck only met Joe that one day. It's the only time he ever right. saw him, and he never met Clara. And when he told me that, I just laughed, and I said, of course he didn't. And he said, <laughs> what do you mean? I said, Clara could not stand Joe. 
when he was being photographed or interviewed. Because that's when he became so pompous, and that's when all of this stuff came out that Clara just couldn't deal with. She wouldn't, so she was probably back in the apartment reading, you know, while all that was going on. But they were photographing in the morning. He had no shirt on. He, they broke for lunch. And it was after he came back from lunch with Clara that he had the shirt on. <laughs> That's cute. So, so who knows what happened in the apartment? <laughs> something, yeah, something, something happened there. But no, she would never, ever, ever, she just did not want to be around if he was being interviewed or photographed. It was finished, and then she would come into the studio like nothing had happened and go about her business. But that, that was a joke she didn't want any part of. <laughs>